Hello, welcome back. Today we're going to look at how to implement a weather API in Touch Designer to get current weather conditions for any location and to have some generative effects update based off of what that current weather and location is. So we will do everything from creating and implementing the API itself to uh, creating a quick little placeholder effect and overlaying this weather data on top of it. So let's get started. Now, first, I'm going to simply create two text dats. One of those text dats we're going to call API, and the other we're going to call request output. Now, let's jump to the internet and actually take a look at what our API is going to look like. So we're going to use Visual Crossing API. Uh, Visual Crossing is the API that I selected for two reasons. It has a metered pricing setup, uh, which is a plan that most other APIs I've come across don't offer. And in addition to this metered pricing, <clears throat> the documentation that comes along with this API, specifically the example code, is going to be a lot more user friendly. Um, and so I think that this is all around a great choice. So to get started here, you're going to want to create an account. Um, I've already got an account created, so mine is coming up as all logged in. Uh, this key is going to be essential going forward, so you're going to want to make sure that you create this before we progress any further. So after we've got the account created, uh, we're going to go to this Weather API tab, click on the Python top search, and then we're going to grab just this top result here. Uh, which is how to load weather data using Python. So essentially, we're just going to take all of this boilerplate code. We are going to put it into Touch Designer, into this API dat. And then we are going to use that API dat with, along with a few modifications to get to the weather API that we want to have here today. So I'm just gonna make sure this is a Python text app. I'm gonna edit this and start by simply importing our classes. Cool. Uh, so let me also open a text port so we can see what's going on. Cool. And I like to do something like this, which is have some debug statement that will print an output to the text port um, at the end of my code, just so that I can tell if there's any errors because this runs uh, and the debug statement tells us what operator that uh, statement is coming from. We can tell that everything else that we've copy and pasted is working correctly. Cool. So I'll grab this next section of code from the website. We can see here that essentially what we're doing is creating a base URL that we're gonna then concatenate some parameters onto using Python string concatenation uh, to build up to a URL that we'll then use to hit the API endpoint and actually make our weather request. So a couple things that I'm gonna change from this section. <clears throat> One is going to be if I go back to the account page. Uh, I'm going to grab API key and replace this with my API key. I'm going to leave the unit group. Uh, this will set it to units. Um, I'm going to leave the location for now. I'm going to leave the dates. I'm going to change this content type to JSON. And that is because JSON is easier to parse natively in touch designer than CSV is. And I'm going to change this include selections to current. Finally, I'm just going to change this import CSV statement to import JSON, uh, since we'll be using a JSON library to use uh, access our JSON object later on. So I will use Control R to run this text stat and make sure everything is working. So far, it looks like it is. And so we'll continue. Our next section of boilerplate code will take our base URL along with our other parameters like location, start date, end date, 
units, content type, etc. And it will produce an API query object that is essentially just this base URL concatenated with all of our other good stuff. So to see what that looks like, we will just debug the API query object. And we can see that what we get is actually this URL. Now, this URL, if we paste into a browser, we can see, so our API is working. And what we're looking at here is actually the response from the endpoint um, that has all of our weather data for Washington, DC. This is not terribly helpful at the moment, uh, but we will get into a more readable uh, format in just a second. For right now, it is just good to know that things are working. Cool. So now we are gonna grab this next section of code, which is going to take our API query and use the URL lib library to create a request and hit the API endpoint. Now I'm just gonna change this variable name to data as I think it looks a little bit cleaner that way and we're not using a CSV anyway. And from here, we're simply going to use the JSON Python library to load our URL response into a JSON object and then dump that JSON object into our request output dat. So to do that, we are going to start with this, and that is a new object called weather data. Is going to be json.loads. We're going to load our data after reading it and we're going to decode it using UTF 8 decoding. Now, I know that's the right decoding to use because later in our boilerplate code example, that is exactly what the virtual cro or visual crossing people are telling us to use. And then from there, we simply need to take our output and load it into our text at using json.dumps. Now, if things are working correctly, we will see that our request output is now being dropped right in this text at. And from there, we're going to be able to parse it right inside Touch Designer, which is going to be great. So now our API is working. Um, it was pretty easy, all things considered. Again, like I said, the documentation and boilerplate code that's available really makes this specific API uh, really user-friendly. What I'm gonna do before we move on from this completely is just create a little bit of functionality and ease of use. So I don't think that we're going to need this anymore. So let's go back to full screen make this smaller. Um, so I think the first thing that we're going to want to do is parameterize. So I'm going to drop these into a component. I'm going to call this component weather API. We're going to customize it. Make a params page. And then I want a location parameter that's going to be a string. I'll default that to Boston. And I want an API key parameter that's also going to be a string. And for that one, I'm going to default it to my personal API key and set it to a password. Now, setting this to password will simply toggle this display to display the parameter with asterisks. Uh, which is helpful for stuff like API keys um, or other things you don't necessarily want the characters displayed for. So just a helpful hint there. All right, we'll go back to our VS code. And in here, all we have to do is replace our parameters with our new custom parameters from our parent component. And so here we will do that via parent.par dot in this case location and then that eval on the end just tells uh, touch designer to evaluate the parameter which for many parameters will be necessary to return the appropriate value um, and i find is just a best practice 
So now if we jump in, look at our API, maybe we open our parent parameters. Location is Boston. So if we run this API using control R, we can see that indeed our request is updating and things appear to be working right. That's awesome. Uh, but I don't want to have to click on this API text stat and hit control R every time I want it to update. So I'm going to add another parameter. I'm going to call that update. I'm going to make it a pulse. And I'm going to then put in a parameter executes. That parameter execute, I'm going to point at the parent and point it at the update parameter. Now we're just going to have it do something when that parameter is pulsed. And what we're going to have it do is simply run our API text stat. So now, there we go. If I change this to Miami and hit update, then we see that our API is called and we have an updated weather result output. Awesome. Now, I'm going to make one more of these parameter executes. I'm going to continue to point it at the parent. And this time, I'm going to use the location parameter. And when the value is changed, we're going to do the same thing. And that means that if we simply change the location, that parameter execute is going to hit the API endpoint again and update without us needing to do anything, as you just see here. Super helpful and definitely makes ease of use uh, quite a bit better here. Awesome. So those are two quick ways uh, to improve our functionality. Now let's focus on maybe parsing this output a little bit. So we're going to parse it using Touch Designer's JSON DAT. Uh, the JSON DAT's great because it'll take a JSON output. Uh, and then it'll format it in this nice nested hierarchical format output. Uh, and additionally, you can use this JSON path filter to access different parts of this output uh, using pretty minimal syntax. So I want this current conditions element of the JSON output because I'm interested in the current weather. So what I'm going to do to get that and I'll do this in another JSON dat is tell Touch Designer that I want to drop two elements into the hierarchy, or two levels into the hierarchy, rather, and then grab the element called current conditions, which is what is replaced right here, or displayed right here. So now what I'm going to do is basically take each of these elements inside of the current conditions. Uh, that are of interest to me and create a separate JSON dat for each of them. And that separate JSON dat is going to hold only the specific output that I'm interested in. For example, if I'm trying to find the conditions, I will see over here, okay, the element is called conditions. So I'll simply type conditions there. And now we'll have just that element returned. I can call this conditions. And then to clean things up a little bit, I will take only the first result and I will have no formatting on the output. So I'm going to do this for a couple other elements like temp. Feels like. Precipitation, precipitation, sunrise, sunset. Oops, not wind. I want wind speed to get the numerical. Uh, 
I want cloud cover, which is going to be returned as a percent. I want the snow. And then finally, I'm going to want the current time. And that current time is going to be the date time element. All right, cool. So now I've got all of my elements of interest. I'm going to use a merge. I'm going to grab those elements. Perfect. I'm going to convert that to a table. I'm going to create another table here with exact dimensions. We're going to give it one column. And we're going to say op convert one dot num rows. And then here, we're going to create our labels. So our labels will be conditions, temperature, feels like, precipitation, inches, sunrise, local time. The wind speed, our cloud cover, which again is a percent, the inches of snow, and our update time, also local. Now I'm going to merge this with our values using append, whoops, append columns. And then we will send that out. Cool. So what we've got here then is a working weather API that will take in a location, will automatically update our weather, and it'll output in this nice little table what our current conditions are. Now, there are two things that we're going to need to fix to make this really, really usable. One of those is an automatic update so that this will update every so often uh, while Touch Designer is open and running, which will be handy in an installation. And the other is that right now, if we try to input a location with a space, we're going to get a nasty error. And that nasty error, if we bring this up, is going to be mostly not mostly, completely, because of that space in our location. So because there's a space in the location and we're just concatenating the URL, that means there's going to be a space in our URL. And what we're learning here is that this is an invalid URL with spaces. We can't have spaces. So to fix that, we're going to write a quick helper function. And that is going to be replace spaces of our input. And so first, we're going to define what our inject string is going to be. That is going to be percent %20, uh, which is the characters that URL-friendly strings replace spaces with. Um, for example, if we take a quick look back at Chrome, um, let's go to Visual Crossings Query Builder. This API will show you what a properly constructed request looks like. And we can see that for a location with a space, the space is replaced here with percent %20. So that's what we're going to be doing in our little helper function. Now, since input is a string, we're going to iterate over all of the characters in that string. If that character is equal to a space, then we're going to simply replace that character with our injection string. And then we're going to return our input. OK, so this should make it pretty easy for us 
and just test this out. Let's do something like debug replace spaces test string with spaces. And let's see what happens here. Clear this to make things easier. Bit of a mess. I think that is because we still have our space here. So if we turn this back to a non-space and then just run our API, we see that, OK, awesome. Our test string is properly replacing spaces with other characters. So we can get rid of this debug. I'm going to get rid of our other print statements just because we don't really need them anymore. And now the only thing we have to do is update this line to wrap our parameter in replace spaces. And now, if we update our location, including spaces, we get no more errors, and we get a nice working API call, um, which is exactly what we want. Now, the last thing that we're going to do here is create a automatic updating functionality. So I'm going to say auto update frequency. I'm going to make this a float, add that, default it to 15. And I'll add a descriptor here. This is going to be in minutes. All right, cool. So the way that we're going to do this automatic updating is we are going to have a timer. That timer is going to have a length that's set based on our update frequency. Specifically, we want that update frequency times 60 to get it in seconds. Uh, I'm going to move this back to make it a little bit simpler. Um, now, this is slightly problematic because if we change this, we really want our timer length here to be changing as well, right? So what we're going to do is create a parameter pointed at our correct parameter and use a chop execute to when these values change, simply initialize and start our timer. Start. Awesome. And so now if we update this, we'll see the timer starts as expected. Uh, right now it's only going to run once. And so we'll change that by turning cycles on, turning the cycle limit off, and outputting our cycles pulse. The cycles pulse, then, if we simply change this a little bit to make it there, our cycles pulse will then change from 0 to 1 whenever there's a cycle that is done. And so what we're going to do is use another chop execute off to on and point that as cycles pulse. And then here, all we're going to do is run our API whenever that cycle pulses. And since that cycle pulses exactly at this frequency, it means that this is the frequency that will be updating our API. Um, so we'll make a call every, in this case, tenth of a second. Um, and that will ensure that our weather stays up to date automatically, regardless of whether we're changing anything or not. So I'll set that back to 15. We can see just for confirmation that our timer length is now 900 seconds as we would expect, which is great. So I will do Alt, right click, drag. Just annotate this a little bit. API setup. And then all of this is going to be JSON parsing. Very good. So now we have our API working great. We have the ability to update a location, spaces or without spaces. 
and have our corresponding weather update as well. So from here, all we need to do is figure out a way to use this information to update a generative visual effect. So to do that, I'm going to do two things. One, I'm going to collapse this again, I'll make another component. I'm going to call this weather reactive effect. I will jump back into the weather reactive effect. I'll customize the parent component. Uh, I'm going to copy a couple of these parameters over using click and drag and then setting our reference location uh, to the source. So now here, these parameters are copied over with all of their settings, and there's a reference that's already automatically generated, which is real nice. Uh, and then I'm also going to add another one called output resolution. I'll make that XY, and I will default it to uh, 1920 by 1280. Cool. So then what I'll do to set up a quick placeholder visual effect, I'm going to just chain a couple noises together to uh, create a nice little displaced noise. Um, don't worry too much about this. I think it's mostly, like I said, for a placeholder effect. Um, there should be some much better, more involved effects that you can make on your own that will better showcase this. So we'll translate this noise a little bit. Uh, let's copy that, we'll point it at the bottom. I'll bring this down, we'll change the seed, and I'll do that maybe one more time. And I'll change the seed again. Give ourselves a null to look at on the background. Cool. Um, all right, now I will just use a monochrome to get that back to mono. I will drop in a lookup, and then I'm going to use some color palettes from this Color Lovers Picker component uh, that I got from the forum at some point. So cool. Now we have a nice little visual effect, nothing too crazy, but it'll give us something to work with here. So what we want is obviously our location and our weather to be displayed over top of this. So what I'm going to do is create a text right there. Uh, this one, we're going to point right at our parent location parameter. I'm going to customize our parent component and parameterize this font size since I know I'm probably going to want to change that later. I think 50 for default seems pretty good. Uh, and then I'm going to leave it in the center. Yeah, it seems good. Um, so now I need to get my actual weather information. So to get my weather information, I'm going to move this over. And from here, we're going to split this output into two separate select dats. And I'm going to select purely on the columns. The first one is going to be keeping the first column, and the second one is going to be keeping the second column. Call this labels, and we'll call this values. So my second text top. Uh, one would think that you slip simply drag a dat in there. And if I wire this up, we can see it on the output. For a couple of reasons, that is not ideal. Um, even if we get rid of this text, we'll see that we're still only seeing one row of our dat. And uh, I want to be able to see all of them at once. So instead of referencing the dat in that way, I'm actually going to go back to Python and we're simply going to grab our labels operator and take the text out of it, which is awesome. So now we have all of our labels nicely arranged, uh, a little bit big and definitely don't want that in the middle because if I put our location back, things get pretty cluttered. So I'm going to do two things. One, I'm going to have a 
weather font multiplier float. It's going to default to 0.6. And I'm going to update this font size. To run off of that, I'm going to left align and I'm going to put its position to be a function of the width. In this case, uh, I'm going to take one sixth of the width and position it there. Now I'm just going to copy and paste that text top, wire it up. I'm going to change our text from labels to values. And I'm going to change our horizontal align to right and simply negate this, which gives us awesome. Um, it gives us a very nicely reactively laid out um, text overlay here. And because we parameterized everything, we can use our font variables to increase the relative sizes here um, and make sure everything looks exactly as we want. For example, if we were going to change the resolution, uh, we might want all of our fonts to be a little bit lower. And just optically, the last thing I'm going to do is increase the line spacing on both of these weather columns because uh, I think it looks a little bit nicer. So go back to our full resolution. We now have our weather overlaid with our location uh, and a nice visual effect. And things are looking pretty nice. Uh, the last thing that we want to be able to do here is actually take the weather information and update the visuals uh, based off of it. So what I'm going to do is grab a couple palettes, and I'm going to use a palette transition as an example uh, of a couple different ways to do this. So I'm just going to drop three different palettes that I will choose. Ooh, that one's nice. That I will choose here. And these three palettes we will then drop into a switch top. And then we'll wire that switch top into our lookup. And I'll get rid of this for now. Cool. So now we have our different palettes. And all I'm going to do is change the palette that we are running into our lookup using our weather. So there are many different ways you can do this. And there are many different parameters, obviously, in any different effect that you can change based off of uh, all of your different weather components. I'm just going to give one example using the temperature to change this palette, uh, like I said, for an example and to be conscious of time. Uh, as you guys have been sitting here for a while already. But just know that this is really only one example. Uh, there are many, many, many different things you can do here. So I'm going to grab our table in a separate select at just to keep things clean. I'll have another select at. I'm going to grab my temperature by taking just this row. And then I'll grab just my value by taking just this column. I'm going to then put this into an evaluate dat. And I'm going to use an expression to range this temperature into indices. So specifically, what we're going to try and do is say, we want this evaluate to output a 0 if our temperature is below something, let's say below 30. If it's below 30, or sorry, above 30, but below something else, we're going to want it to output a 1. Um, and otherwise, we're going to want it to output a 2. So what I'm going to do is write this. I want to output 0 if float me.inputCell.val. So here I'm casting the input cell value as a float because it's a string, is less than 30. Otherwise, else, 1 if cast as a float, my input cell value is less than 60, and otherwise we're going to want to output a 2. And then I'll, uh, what have I done? 
yeah, okay. So that's working. Um, Alt N to output a null. I'll call this IDX. And then all we need to do is change this to be op IDX dot text. And I actually need to cast this as a float as well. And so now if we go to our parent component and maybe we give ourselves an output here so that we can see everything more clearly. If we give ourselves, here we go. Cool, so we have our effect and we can see that if I put in somewhere that has a low temperature, like let's say Anchorage, we can see that we are reading a different palette. If I go to New York, our palette is again changed. Uh, and then if we go back to Doha, we have our third palette. Uh, and the corresponding weather readings are, of course, changing as well. So now, just to summarize, we have a weather reactive effect that is overlaying location-specific current weather and will change the visual effects based off of what that weather actually is. I hope you have enjoyed.